In every tale, there are those who confront formidable adversaries, some triumph over the greatest dangers, while others face tragic fates. Yet, despite their very destinies, they all share a common trait. They are the heroes, the protectors who rise to the challenge and shape their legends. Are you familiar with each of these beings? Prince Yamato Takaru, one of Japan's most legendary heroes, embodies the spirit of bravery and adventure in ancient Japanese mythology. Born as Prince Asu, he was the son of Emperor Keiku, the 12th emperor of Japan, and from a young age, he demonstrated unparalleled martial prowess. However, his early life was marked by turmoil. After killing his own brother in a fit of rage, his father began to distrust him, sending him on dangerous missions to test his loyalty and capabilities. These missions, while perilous, shaped Yamato into a hero renowned for his cunning, strength, and honor. One of Yamato's first great feats was his mission to subdue the Kamaso brothers, a rebellious tribe in southern Japan. Disguising himself as a maid at a banquet, Yamato approached the unsuspecting chieftains and, with swift precision, assassinated them. As he delivered the fatal blow, the leader of the Kamaso, in admiration of the young prince's bravery, gave him the title Yamato Takaru, meaning the brave of Yamato. This marked the beginning of his legend, and Yamato Takaru's reputation grew as a warrior of great skill and fearlessness. Perhaps one of his most famous adventures involved the Eastern Expedition, a mission assigned by his father to pacify the unruly tribes of the East. Armed with the sword Kusanagi, a legendary sword gifted to him by the goddess Amaterasu, Yamato Takaru faced countless dangers on this journey. One particularly famous tale describes how he was nearly ambushed by enemies who set the surrounding grassland on fire. Using the Kusanagi sword, which had the power to control the wind, Yamato cut down the grass and redirected the flames back toward his enemies, securing his victory and further solidifying his status as a heroic figure. Despite his many victories, Yamato Takaru's life was one of constant challenge. His father continued to send him on dangerous missions, and it is said that Yamato Takaru began to feel the weight of his duties. On one final mission, while crossing the treacherous Ayase province, Yamato fell ill. Without the protection of the Kusanagi sword, which he had left behind as an offering to the gods, he succumbed to his weakness. In his final moments, he is said to have transformed into a great white bird and ascended to the heavens, a symbol of his heroic spirit departing the mortal realm. Prince Yamato Takaru's legacy is deeply embedded in Japanese mythology. His life represents the virtues of courage, loyalty, and sacrifice, but also serves as a reminder of the burden carried by heroes. Temples and shrines across Japan, including the famous Odorashiko Shrine, are dedicated to his memory. His story continues to be celebrated as a timeless tale of valor and endurance, reflecting the ancient Japanese ideals of a true warrior hero. Wetzilopochtli, one of the most revered gods in Aztec mythology, was the embodiment of the sun and war. His name, which means hummingbird of the south or left-handed hummingbird, reflects his association with the sun's journey across the southern sky and the fierce nature of the warrior. In the grand pantheon of the Aztecs, he occupied a paramount position as the god who both illuminated the earth and ensured the Aztec supremacy in warfare. But beyond his cosmic and military roles, Wetzilopochtli's story is one of heroism, where he emerged as a savior and protector of the Aztec people, guiding them toward their destiny. In one of the most famous myths, Wetzilopochtli was born miraculously to Kuatlikwe, the earth goddess, who conceived him while sweeping a temple on Mount Coatepec. She found a bundle of feathers, which she tucked into her waistband, only to discover she had become pregnant. Her other children, the 400 stars called Sensen Huitznawa, and her daughter, Koyashauki, were enraged by this mysterious pregnancy. They believed Kuatlikwe had dishonored them and planned to kill her. However, just as they were about to strike, Wetzilopochtli was born fully grown, fully armed, and ready for battle. His first heroic act was the defeat of his siblings, including Koyashauki, whom he decapitated, sending her head tumbling down the mountain. This violent victory established him as the god of war and demonstrated his fierce protection over his mother, reflecting the Aztec values of loyalty and warrior prowess. As the god of the sun, 
Huitzilopochtli took on an equally crucial role in maintaining the cosmos. The Aztecs believed that the sun required constant nourishment to survive, and this came in the form of human blood and hearts offered through ritual sacrifice. Without these offerings, the sun, and by extension, the world, would cease to exist. Huitzilopochtli's daily journey across the sky was seen as an epic battle against darkness and chaos, specifically the forces of the underworld. Each night, he would descend into Miklin, the realm of the dead, where he fought tirelessly to ensure the sun's rebirth the next day. In this sense, Huitzilopochtli was not just a god but a hero who fought every day to maintain balance in the universe, protecting both the gods and humanity from eternal darkness. Huitzilopochtli's influence extended beyond the spiritual and into the foundation of the Aztec Empire itself. According to the myth, Huitzilopochtli commanded the Mexica to leave their ancestral home of Aztlan and embark on a long journey in search of a new homeland. After years of wandering, they finally saw the prophesied sign, an eagle perched on a cactus, devouring a serpent, on an island in the middle of Lake Texcoco. This was where they established Tenochtitlan, the heart of the Aztec Empire. Huitzilopochtli's guidance in this journey mirrors that of a heroic leader, ensuring the survival and prosperity of his people, and further cementing his role as a central figure in their mythology. As both a god and a hero, Huitzilopochtli symbolized the courage, strength, and sacrifice that were vital to the survival of the Aztec civilization. Cuculain, often called the Hound of Ulster, is one of the most iconic figures in Irish mythology, especially celebrated in the Ulster Cycle. Born as Satanta, his early life was marked by remarkable strength and talent. His destiny to become a great warrior was foretold by the Druids, as he was the son of the god Luf, a deity associated with the sun, light and skills, and Dykton, the sister of the king of Ulster, Conchobar Mac Nessa. From a young age, Satanta exhibited exceptional prowess, which would eventually lead to the events that earned him his famous title. The name Kukulain, meaning the Hound of Kulan, comes from a pivotal moment in his youth. One evening, Satanta was invited to a feast by Conchobar at the house of the blacksmith Kulan. Arriving late, he encountered Kulan's fierce guard dog, which attacked him. In self-defense, Satanta killed the Hound with his bare hands. Horrified by the act, but recognizing his responsibility, Satanta offered to take the place of the dog as Cullen's protector until a replacement could be trained. This act of honor and responsibility earned him the name Ku Cullen, Cullen's Hound, cementing his role as the guardian of Ulster. Ku Cullen's heroics are most famously detailed in the epic The Cattle Raid of Cooley, where he single-handedly defends Ulster against the armies of Queen Medb of Connet. His ferocity in battle is unmatched, especially when he enters his terrifying Ryastrad or Warp Spasm, a battle frenzy that transforms his body into a monstrous, unrecognizable form. In this state, he becomes a whirlwind of destruction, obliterating entire armies with his legendary spear, the Gay Balg. Despite being just a teenager during these events, his unmatched skill and divine parentage make him virtually unstoppable. However, beneath the fierce warrior exterior, Kukulain was a deeply tragic figure. His life was fraught with prophecies of doom. One of the most heart-wrenching aspects of his story is his relationship with his best friend, Ferdiad, who was coerced into battling Ku Kulain during the Tain. The duel between the two warriors, fought over three days, is one of the most emotional moments in Irish mythology. Despite their bond, Ku Kulain kills Ferdiad in a bitter, agonizing fight, a victory that leaves him devastated. In the end, Ku Kulain's life comes to a close as tragically as it was lived. After being weakened by multiple prophecies and trickery, he faces his final battle. Even in death, he refuses to fall. He ties himself to a standing stone so that his enemies will believe he is still alive. Only when a raven, symbolizing the war goddess Morrigan, lands on his shoulder do his enemies dare approach, signaling his final demise. His death marks the end of an era for Ulster, but his legacy as the fearless hound of Ulster lives on, immortalized in the myths and stories of Ireland. If you enjoy this type of content, consider subscribing. It's free and you can unsubscribe later. Siegfried, often called Sigurd in the Volsunga Saga and the Nibelungenlied, is one of the most iconic heroes in Germanic and Norse mythology. 
His most famous title, Dragon Slayer, comes from his legendary defeat of the Dragon Fafnir, a feat that marks him as a hero of immense strength and cunning. Siegfried is depicted as a noble warrior, born of royal blood, destined for greatness. His character, imbued with courage and a sense of adventure, embodies the traits of the archetypal hero, combining physical prowess with a sharp mind. The tale of Siegfried's dragon slaying begins with Fafnir, once a dwarf transformed into a monstrous dragon after greed consumed him. Fafnir guarded an immense treasure, known as the Cursed Horde of the Nibelungs, a treasure said to bring doom to its possessor. Guided by Regan, Fafnir's brother and a master blacksmith, Siegfried takes on the task of slaying the dragon. Using a sword forged by Regan, often called Bamung or Graham, Siegfried confronts Fafnir in a battle that tests both his strength and bravery. He ultimately slays the dragon by stabbing it through its heart, bathing in its blood to gain invulnerability. The dragon's blood, while granting Siegfried invulnerability, leaves one fatal flaw. As the hero bathed in Fafnir's blood, a single leaf from a linden tree fell on his back, preventing the blood from covering that spot. This vulnerability becomes Siegfried's Achilles' heel, a critical detail in his eventual demise. In addition to his newfound invulnerability, Siegfried also gains the ability to understand the language of birds, which warn him of the treacherous intentions of Regan, who had planned to betray him and take the treasure for himself. Siegfried's role as a hero expands beyond his dragon slaying. His victory over Fafnir makes him a figure of great renown, and he becomes entangled in the complex politics of the royal courts. In the Nibelungen lead, he marries Kriemhild, sister to King Gunther of Burgundy, and plays a key role in helping the king win the hand of the Valkyrie warrior queen, Brunhild. However, Siegfried's heroic deeds also plant the seeds of his downfall, as jealousy, deception, and fate conspire against him. His eventual murder at the hands of Gunther's vassal, Hagen, is a tragic end to his heroic life, with Hagen exploiting the knowledge of Siegfried's one vulnerable spot. The legacy of Siegfried, the Dragon Slayer, is one of both triumph and tragedy. His courage, strength, and determination in the face of danger made him a hero worthy of song and legend. Yet, like many mythological figures, his tragic flaws and the inevitability of fate underscored his mortality. Siegfried's tale endures as a classic story of the heroic journey, one that traverses glory, betrayal, and ultimately, an untimely death. His legend continues to inspire art, literature, and opera, immortalizing him as the fearless slayer of dragons and a tragic hero of Germanic myth. Gilgamesh, the legendary king of Uruk, stands as one of the earliest epic heroes in world literature. His story, recounted in the Epic of Gilgamesh, originates from ancient Mesopotamia, particularly Sumer, around 2100 BCE. Gilgamesh, two-thirds divine and one-third human, was the son of the goddess Ninsun and the mortal king Lugalbanda. His reign over the city of Uruk is said to have brought both prosperity and oppression. As a powerful and seemingly invincible ruler, Gilgamesh was notorious for his arrogance and excesses, building massive walls around Uruk and abusing his people's trust. His strength and intelligence set him apart, but his unchecked desires led to unrest among his subjects, who eventually sought divine intervention. In response to the people's pleas, the gods created Enkidu, a wild man equal to Gilgamesh in strength, to challenge the king. Born of clay and untouched by civilization, Enkidu lived among animals in the wilderness until a temple priestess tamed him, teaching him human ways. Enkidu and Gilgamesh first met in a fierce battle, where neither could gain the upper hand. This fight, however, gave birth to an unshakable friendship, as they recognized each other's strength and worth. Together, they embarked on heroic adventures, seeking fame and glory, their first quest being the defeat of Humbaba, the monstrous guardian of the cedar forest. The journey to slay Humbaba proved a test of Gilgamesh's courage and Enkidu's loyalty. With the help of the sun god Shamash, they overpowered Humbaba, despite his pleas for mercy. The act of killing the forest guardian angered the gods, particularly the goddess Ishtar, who sought Gilgamesh's affections but was spurned by him. In retaliation, Ishtar unleashed the Bull of Heaven upon Uruk, causing destruction and death. 
Gilgamesh and Enkidu managed to slay the bull, but this victory came with dire consequences. The gods decreed that Enkidu must die as punishment for these transgressions, and his death sent Gilgamesh spiraling into grief. Enkidu's death profoundly changed Gilgamesh. Confronted with the reality of mortality, he set out on a new quest, the search for immortality. His journey led him to Utnapishtim, the survivor of the Great Flood, similar to Noah's in later traditions, who had been granted eternal life by the gods. Gilgamesh learned from Utnapishtim that immortality was not meant for mortals. Despite his best efforts, including retrieving a plant of eternal youth from the ocean depths, Gilgamesh ultimately failed to secure everlasting life, as the plant was stolen by a serpent. In the end, Gilgamesh returned to Uruk, wiser but resigned to his fate as a mortal king. The walls of Uruk, which he had once built in arrogance, became a symbol of his enduring legacy. He accepted that true immortality lay in the memory of his deeds and the city he had shaped. Gilgamesh's story, carved onto ancient tablets, became a timeless reminder of the human struggle against death, the power of friendship, and the quest for meaning in a fleeting world. His reign, full of triumph and tragedy, immortalized him as a hero, not through divine immortality, but through the lasting impact of his epic journey. Arthur Pendragon, one of the most legendary figures in British mythology, was born under circumstances marked by magic and prophecy. His father, Uther Pendragon, coveted a grain, the wife of Duke Gorlois of Cornwall. With the help of the wizard Merlin, Uther disguised himself as Gorlois to seduce a grain, resulting in the conception of Arthur. Following this, Merlin took the infant Arthur from a grain and placed him in the care of Sir Ector, ensuring his safety and anonymity until he was ready to fulfill his destiny. Arthur grew up unaware of his royal lineage, serving as a squire to Sir Ector's son, Kay. Arthur's claim to the throne was revealed through the miraculous pulling of the sword from the stone. This sword, inscribed with the message that only the rightful king could draw it, was set in a stone by Merlin as a test of legitimacy. Arthur, demonstrating his inherent right to rule, effortlessly removed the sword, thus proving himself as the true king of Britain. This act united the realm and established Arthur as a leader who would preside over a golden age of chivalry and justice, symbolized by the establishment of Camelot. The sword Excalibur, often confused with the sword in the stone, was given to Arthur by the Lady of the Lake, an important mystical figure in Arthurian legend. Excalibur was renowned for its magical properties and was said to have a scabbard that protected its wielder from injury in battle. This sword became a symbol of Arthur's divine right and his extraordinary prowess as a warrior. With Excalibur in hand, Arthur led his knights on numerous quests, including the defense of Britain against various foes. Arthur's reign was marred by internal strife, particularly involving his queen, Guinevere, and his greatest knight, Sir Lancelot. Their affair caused a rift in Camelot, leading to civil unrest and weakening the unity of the Round Table. Additionally, Arthur faced betrayal from his own bloodline. Mordred, his nephew and in some versions his son by his half-sister Morgaus, sought to usurp the throne. This led to the catastrophic Battle of Camelon, where Arthur and Mordred faced each other in combat. Mortally wounded in the battle, Arthur was taken to the mystical Isle of Avalon by the Enchantress Morgan Le Fay and other ladies of the lake. According to legend, Arthur did not die but fell into a deep, healing sleep. The myth concludes with the promise that Arthur will return in Britain's greatest hour of need, embodying the role of the once and future king. This enduring motif of Arthur's eventual return keeps his legacy alive in British folklore and myth. Thor, one of the most revered gods in Norse mythology, stands as the embodiment of strength, courage, and protection. Known by the title God of Thunder, Thor's primary role was defending Asgard, the realm of the gods, and Midgard, the world of humans, from giants and other malevolent beings. Thor is depicted as a powerful, red-bearded warrior, wielding the mighty hammer Mjolnir, a weapon so potent that it could level mountains and summon thunder and lightning. His importance in the pantheon was profound, and he was often seen as the guardian of order against chaos. In the myths, Thor's heroism is closely tied to his defense against the Jotnar, the Frost and Fire Giants, 
who constantly threatened the stability of the Nine Realms. Thor's immense strength, unmatched even among the gods, allowed him to confront these towering foes head-on. His hammer, Mjolnir, was his weapon of choice, capable of not only delivering crushing blows but also returning to his hand after being thrown. To control its immense power, Thor wore iron gloves and a belt that doubled his strength. These tools, along with his indomitable spirit, made him a hero to both gods and mortals. Thor's heroics are perhaps best showcased in the myth of his journey to the land of the giants, Jotunheim. In one tale, Thor challenges the giant king Utgard Loki, only to be bested in a series of magical illusions. Yet, despite being deceived, Thor's persistence and sheer might impress the giants, proving his unwavering courage. In another iconic story, Thor battles the giant Hrungnir, who boasted of his invulnerability. Thor, with Mjolnir in hand, kills Hrungnir with a single blow, solidifying his role as the ultimate protector of Asgard and Midgard. Thor was not only a warrior god, but also deeply connected to humanity. He was considered the guardian of farmers and ordinary people, revered for bringing rain that nourished the crops. His connection to thunder symbolized fertility and growth, and many Norsemen invoked Thor's name for blessings of strength and protection in everyday life. In battle, warriors would call upon Thor to grant them the power to overcome their enemies, much like Thor vanquished the cosmic forces that threatened the gods. As Ragnarok, the prophesied end of the world, loomed, Thor's role as a protector remained steadfast. In this cataclysmic event, Thor was fated to face his greatest and final adversary, the world serpent, Jormungandr. The two, bitter enemies since the dawn of time, were destined to destroy each other in an epic battle. Thor slays Jormungandr but succumbs to its venom shortly after. This ultimate sacrifice underscores his role as the protector who fought to the end for the safety of gods and humans alike, solidifying his legacy as one of the greatest heroes in Norse mythology. Rama, often hailed as one of the most revered figures in Hindu mythology, is the seventh avatar of Vishnu, embodying the virtues of truth, righteousness, and devotion. His full name, Ramachandra, translates to beautiful, lovely moon, reflecting his serene and divine nature. As the protagonist of the epic Ramayana, Rama is a symbol of ideal kingship, embodying compassion, strength, and selfless love. His story is a timeless narrative of duty and devotion, offering profound insights into ethical conduct and justice. Rama's upbringing was marked by his impeccable adherence to Dharma, which was tested early when he willingly accepted a 14-year exile in the forest to honor a promise made by his father to Queen Kakei. This act of obedience not only demonstrates his deep respect for family and duty, but also solidifies his standing as a paragon of virtue in the epic. One of the most poignant aspects of Rama's life is his relationship with his wife, Sita, and his battle against the demon king Ravana, who abducts her. The story of Rama's unwavering loyalty and the arduous journey he embarks on to rescue Sita showcases his steadfast commitment to righteousness. Alongside his loyal brother Lakshmana and the devoted Hanuman, Rama fights a great war in Lanka, eventually defeating Ravana and restoring peace. In his infant form, Rama is also worshipped as Ram Lala, a cherished deity in temples across India. This form embodies the innocence, purity, and divinity of the young Rama, drawing parallels to the tenderness of a child who is also an avatar of supreme cosmic forces. In this role, devotees often find a personal connection to Rama, seeing him as a protector and a source of boundless love. The many names and forms of Rama reflect the multifaceted nature of his role as both a divine being and an ideal human, offering timeless lessons in virtue, courage, and devotion. Sun Wukong, the Monkey King, is one of the most renowned figures in Chinese mythology, celebrated as both a trickster and a hero. Born from a stone egg on the mountain of flowers and fruit, he is said to have been imbued with the power of the heavens and the earth. Sun Wukong's early life was marked by a fierce determination to overcome mortality, which led him to train under the Taoist Master Subyuti, where he learned the 72 transformations, a skill allowing him to shapeshift into almost anything. His indomitable will and incredible powers, including superhuman strength, speed, 
and the ability to summon an army of clones from his own hair set him apart as a hero of exceptional prowess. As Sun Wukong's fame grew, so did his ambition. He declared himself the Great Sage, equal to heaven, and rebelled against the celestial authorities when they refused to recognize his title. This defiance led to a fierce conflict between Wukong and the gods, during which he wreaked havoc in heaven, defeating celestial armies and even outwitting the Jade Emperor. His most iconic weapon, the Rui Jingu Bang, a magical, size-shifting staff, was originally taken from the Dragon King's underwater palace, symbolizing Wukong's ability to triumph over powerful adversaries. Despite his rebellious nature, his actions during this period reflect the heroic qualities of challenging unjust authority and striving for autonomy. After his defeat by Buddha, who trapped him under a mountain for 500 years, Sun Wukong's role transformed into that of a protector and guide. His path to redemption began when he was freed by the monk Shanzong during the Tang Dynasty. This marked the beginning of the famous journey described in The Journey to the West, a classic novel of Chinese literature. Sun Wukong accompanied Shanzong on his pilgrimage to retrieve sacred Buddhist scriptures, and during this journey, the Monkey King fought off numerous demons, monsters, and spirits. His martial skills and wit allowed him to protect the monk from almost certain death many times, and his loyalty to the cause evolved, highlighting his heroism in the service of a greater good. Wukong's role as a hero, however, is complex. While undeniably powerful, he still struggles with impulsiveness, arrogance, and a tendency toward violence. Over the course of the journey, Sun Wukong learns humility and discipline under Shanzong's guidance. His inner growth and ability to protect others demonstrate that true heroism is not just about strength or cleverness, but also about the capacity for self-improvement and selflessness. His evolution from a rebellious trickster to a wise and formidable protector is a hallmark of his character and a central theme in his story. By the end of the journey to the West, Sun Wukong attains enlightenment and is granted the title Victorious Fighting Buddha. His journey, both literal and spiritual, illustrates the complexities of heroism in Chinese mythology, blending traits of rebellion, loyalty, wisdom, and power. As the Monkey King, Sun Wukong remains an enduring symbol of perseverance, transformation, and the triumph of the spirit. His legacy as a hero continues to resonate in Chinese culture and beyond, inspiring countless retellings and adaptations of his story. Heracles, known to the Romans as Hercules, stands as one of the most iconic figures in Greek mythology, revered as the god of strength and heroes. His origin story is one of both divine favor and mortal suffering. Born to Zeus, king of the gods, and the mortal woman Alcmene, Heracles was destined for greatness. Yet, his path to heroism was marred by the jealousy of Hera, Zeus' wife, who despised him for being the product of Zeus' infidelity. In a fit of rage, Hera sent two serpents to kill the infant Heracles, but even as a baby, his immense strength was evident. Heracles strangled the serpents in his crib, signaling that his life would be one of extraordinary feats and incredible challenges. As Heracles grew, his strength became legendary, but Hera's wrath followed him. In adulthood, she inflicted a tragic madness upon him, causing him to kill his own wife, Megara, and their children. Stricken with guilt and seeking atonement, Heracles consulted the Oracle of Delphi. He was directed to serve King Eurystheus of Mycenae, who, under Hera's influence, imposed upon Heracles a series of nearly impossible tasks known as the Twelve Labors. These labors, designed to destroy him, would instead cement his status as one of the greatest heroes in myth. The Twelve Labors are the cornerstone of Heracles' legend. They ranged from slaying fearsome beasts, such as the Nemean lion and the Hydra, to capturing elusive creatures like the Serenian hind and the Aramanthian boar. Heracles also faced tasks that involved cleansing, such as diverting rivers to clean the Aegean stables, and retrieving prized items like the girdle of Hippolyta and the apples of the Hesperides. His feats were not just demonstrations of brute strength. They showcased his cunning, endurance, and the favor of the gods. For instance, when faced with the Hydra, a serpent-like monster that regrew its heads when severed, Heracles used fire to cauterize the stumps, preventing their regeneration. Beyond the labors, 
Heracles' life was filled with other heroic exploits. He participated in the Argonauts' quest for the Golden Fleece and defended the gods against the giants during the Gigantomachy. Yet, his mortal life was plagued with strife. He faced betrayals, heartbreaks, and new forms of Hera's vengeance, culminating in a tragic end. Deceived into wearing a poison tunic by his second wife, Diana, Heracles suffered unbearable pain. To escape this torment, he built a funeral pyre and laid himself upon it, asking to be set ablaze. But this was not the end of his story. In recognition of his sufferings and heroic deeds, the gods welcomed Heracles into Olympus after his death. There, he was granted immortality and took his place among the gods, marrying Hebe, the goddess of youth. He became venerated not just for his strength, but for his resilience, perseverance, and capacity for overcoming trials. As the god of strength and heroes, Heracles embodies the ideal hero, one whose greatest victories come not from avoiding hardships, but from facing them with unmatched fortitude. In every world, light always casts a shadow, and in the realm of mythology, this means there are beings who dwell in darkness. Let me introduce you to these enigmatic figures who embody the darker side of legend, the villains. For a deeper dive into these mythical antagonists, click on the video to your left. If you're eager to explore more fascinating tales from mythology, check out the video to your right. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay updated with our latest content.